Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Security and Sandwiches session for the month of June in 2024. Glad that you've joined us today. We hope that uh, this will be an informative and instructional experience for you. As we get started here, as and as we go throughout the whole event, if there are any particular questions that you may have that come up, please feel free to drop those into the chat. I do anticipate that we will have some time at the end to go over um, some of those questions and answer anything that you might need additional information on. And as we go through the course of the session today, I'll try to keep an eye on that chat as well. And if there's anything pertinent to what we're discussing at that point in time, we'll try and get that covered then at that moment. All right, so by way of introduction, my name is Adam Winterton. Um, I work for Stone Security and I've been here for about five years now. Um, I've got about 13 years in the industry and I currently run our Global Technology Center located in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you're ever in Nevada, please feel free to come on in, take a stop by. It is our demo showpiece, our, our nice showroom floor, as you know, if we were a used car salesman, but of course we're not. So come take a look and see what we have to offer here. We can definitely show you some really cool things. And I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Today we're going to be covering kind of a, a little bit of a random collection of topics on LinLS2 OnGuard, uh, targeted more towards a little bit of an advanced uh, audience. We are going to look at custom layouts in OnGuard's Monitor, which is the web-based monitoring application. We're also going to look at how to trace a badge, a person, a door, and what the options are there and where we can make that trace happen. We're also going to look at maps. Um, and this is specifically maps inside of OnGuard. And we'll build some of those. We'll also look at custom fields with Form Designer and how we build custom fields or add custom fields to forms inside of OnGuard. And then, given time, we should also be able to, as a bonus, go over some, some uh, reporting and some advanced reporting options, which I know has been a, a frequent request as well. All right, so with that, let's just dig right in. So first thing we're going to do, what, what I have pulled up right now is our, sorry, our LinLS2 OnGuard web console login. And so I'm going to use my directory account, which is tied to our Active Directory. And then I can just use my domain credentials to log in. Once we get logged in, we're presented with uh, several dashboards, which we've gone over previously. And if we scroll down to the bottom of that, we have this section with all of these icons. Now, just to kind of review some of this, the dark blue icons, these are, these are icons that pull up a thick client install. So thick client meaning this is the full installed application um, that we're traditionally used to. Things like alarm monitoring, uh, system administration, and so on. If you don't have those installed on your computer, clicking on that icon is, is not going to take you anywhere. Any of the light blue icons, though, these are links to the web clients or the web versions of, of some of these applications. And so we're going to start off here in the monitor application, which takes us to a list like this. Now, if you have a very active system, as soon as you pull this up, you're going to start getting a bunch of information. Right now, we're looking at alarms. Uh, we can look at badge only or non-badge or pending. We can also look at historical information over on the right-hand side. Right now, we can just say, show me the last seven days and hit apply. Here's the last seven days of information that's happening. Now, right now, we're looking at alarms. And so these aren't necessarily all alarms, but it's things like access granted, 
access denied if they happen to be here, door forced open, and so on. This is just what we would typically see compared to the alarm monitoring application, which I'll pop that up here. So here's our alarm, mon our alarm monitoring, and it's been a quiet morning so far. I can go and look at that historical, though. We'll, we'll not jump too far ahead. All right, so back here. Now, let's say you wanted to split this up into some different views. Well, I've got different views kind of pre-built, and I can select those. So we can just look at badge-only events. On these badge only events, again, live. So if uh, we were to have some live events, we would see that. Heard my front door just open, so I might have one pop up here in a minute. Otherwise, we can look at historical again. We'll look at, say, the, the past seven days and apply. And this is all badge events. So you notice there's a few things missing from here. The door forced opens, the um, door held opens, the you know panel offline. Those don't show up here because, you know, we're filtering to just badges. Then we've got non-badge events, which is going to give us basically the rest of what was taken out of there. Any pending alarms, if there are any. We're pretty good about clearing our alarms here. Historical pulls up a little bit. Okay. Um, hardware tree. We can see the status of all of our hardware. If you have your video pulled into OnGuard, then you would have a video tile here. And maps, if you have maps, you would be able to show that here. Now we're gonna look at maps, so we're gonna build one, and we'll see that here later. Um, but to dive into the custom layouts, because oftentimes we, we wanna see more information than just what we can see on these individual filters by itself or we want to arrange it in a way that we know specifically, if I look at this portion of my screen, this is what I expect to see there. Now, I already have one built out, and it looks kind of like this. So what we have is, on the left-hand side, here's my hardware tree. On the right-hand side, I've got that split top and bottom with badge events at the top and non-badge events at the bottom. And we can, you can see that these are also on tabs. So we can add additional tabs to that if we wanted to. So how did we get this? Well, let's just start with building a new one. So we'll say a new layout. Security and sandwiches layout. We'll hit save. So that's created now the layout. So if we click on it, it says, all right. What do you want to see? We need some widgets. So we've got a, a, a field up in the top left where we can add the name. We kind of need to decide what we want in there before we name it. Um, so if we do alarm queue, all right, and all alarms, badge only or non-badge events, let's say badge only, and we're going to give it a name and call it badge only. I can type correctly. All right. And the date range, if we want to put in a date range, we're going to leave that just as the default for now. And we can hit finish. And so now we have a layout with just that badge only alarms. Now, a couple things to notice up here on the title you see it's added a little asterisk there so that's telling us that we have modified this and we have not saved it yet so we can save changes you'll see that disappears you can also save a copy so if there's if there's a layout that you have that you like already you can save a copy of that and then you can tweak it to something that is a little different or play with it all right so if we keep going if i change this to live you'll see that that also changes so what you want this to show we can say the last seven days apply and you'll see that that's still showing there so we could call this layout even um, access uh, badge events for the last seven days 
and we could save that layout. And then anytime you just want to automatically go back and look at the last seven days, you recall that layout and it's there. Um, all right. I believe we can even add as a filter option. So all conditions and let's say card holder, controller, sub devices, priority. So if our access denied are a priority above um, a certain level, generally 50 is your, your happy access level. Uh, you're, you're happy, you know, that everything's working as intended. Um, out of the gate, you go up to 100 and then 200 on different events. And we'll, we can see those as well. But you could filter that down to there. Um, time, priority, device, device groups, logical device, a couple different options in there. You can filter, or sorry, you can sort based on name, date, time, you know, any of the columns you can filter. Typically, we want to keep it filtered based on date, put the newest at the top. All of these options should save as part of our layout. Okay, so let's add some additional elements here. Um, I can add across the top a new tab. So we see we have our badge only alarms there and our new widget that we're adding here. Let's call this non badge events or alarms. Alarm queue, non badge. And we can even scope that down to show only pending alarms if we wanted to give ourselves a queue to work off of. All right. Now, great. So I've got two tabs, but I want to see both at the same time. So what you can do is you can just click and drag that tab. And now you can see contextually we're getting different zones inside of our monitor. So let's put it over here off to the right hand side. Now we have both of these side by side simultaneously and we'll see those come in as we go. So I can go historical last seven days and save. And now I can save that layout. So if I go somewhere else and I can go back, it recalls that just as it was. If we go set those both to live, save our layout. I can go anywhere else and then back to SNS, and there we are back to live. And I forgot to hit apply on that first one, so just note, hit apply. Okay, well, what else can we pull in here? Let's add in another element, so another widget. Um, so we've got the alarm queue, we've looked at that, badge only, non-badge, all alarms. We also have a hardware listing, so we can pull up our device tree. All right. What other options do we have? Cardholder verify. Here, I believe it's going to make us select a reader. Let's try it without it. Show reader name, top position, display details, cardholder name, badge ID, view details, finish. Yes, it is going to make us select a reader. So if we do our secure vestibule door and finish. Okay, now we have that. Hello, I'm okay. All right. Video tile. One camera, four cameras. It may not let me add this because I don't have cameras. At least two required. One camera. Yeah. So it won't let me add that one in. Um, active video monitor. Let's see if it'll let me add that one in. There we go and map, which I don't have any maps, so it won't let me select one, but we'll come back to maps. Now I've got, again, multiple tabs. We can take one, let's pull this one over here. We can add it to the other side, so now we can toggle back and forth between them. Let's say we always want our video up, let's pull that up down across the bottom. We can arrange these 
in any, really in a lot of different ways. So you can see we can get that screen broken up in a lot of different sections here. And it just keeps going and going from there. So we can really subdivide that. Okay. All right. And then we can save that layout, save changes. We can also, if you notice the other options here, open in a new window. So we can open a new window of just that layout. Which actually also made a copy of it. Now, if you need to delete any of these, you'll notice there's not a delete option here, but I believe if we hit the edit, then on our custom, we can click the, custom, the, the, the one that we want to delete, and now we have the delete option there. But here's our layout. So it's a lot nicer to do that than having to toggle between all the different views and everything as we go. You can pull it up just exactly the way you want, arrange it however you want to make it work for what you need. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to look at is live and historical trace. So tracing is, uh, it's one way to backtrack is one way to say it, uh, where a badge went. But tracing is we're going to monitor a single element in the system and gather details about what that is. Now, the easiest place to show this to start off with is actually inside of Alarm Manager. So we're going to start here. If I right-click on a panel... So this is my hardware controller that all these other doors and panels are connected to. If I right click on it, I can trace a panel. When I hit trace, I get a pop-up box that says historical trace or live trace. I can select one or the other or both. So if I just do live trace and hit okay, we get this that pops up showing live activity that is sub or connected to this panel. Now, if I go to, um, let's do historical, wrong button. Okay, so trace, and we do historical, and let's say for today, we'll just do today. We can even dial it back to, say, start yesterday, and we'll hit OK. And here is all the events from yesterday and today. All right. Let's look at another one. We can also trace an individual door. This is really helpful when you're trying to troubleshoot why a door is constantly showing, you know, door forced open or door held or, or whatever it might be. You can come in, you can trace a specific door. So we'll right click, we'll hit trace. Again, we can do historical trace if we want to get some running history. So we'll do the same thing. We'll say start yesterday to today. We'll also include the live trace in there. And I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. So if I pull this over here, and on my secure vestibule door, if I go to open door, we should see that event pop up. I might have this filtered. Um, so you can see that showed up here on the main alarm monitor window, open door command issue, door not used. We'll do it again and we'll see that update. So open door. It's waiting for that door to be used or not used in order to update that. So there we go. All right. So here we go. We have them here as well. Now, when you have a system with, you know, 300 plus doors or whatever, the main alarm monitor window can get kind of overloaded with a lot of information. And so tracing an individual door is one way to narrow that down to just a singular door. So you can see we had two access granted this morning. There are the two open door command issues 
open door command issued, door not used. Now, one other feature that when you get is when you get into this trace, you can come and right click on, uh, I believe most of these column headers. And you can see that it pops up a window and the information in this window is it's it's populated by what is in our list here. So let me actually do a trace on this with historical. And we're going to go back a little further in time so we have more options. So here we go. All right. Sorted by date and time with newest at the top. Now if I right click on my alarm description, now I've got more options here. So if you're trying to troubleshoot, say, a door forced, it might be helpful just to filter out everything else. So here are just my door forced. If you wanted to also include access granted, held, um, whatever else we might need, you can adjust your filter. Now, this is not an option in your main alarm window. Because these are all the events, all the alarms coming in, they don't want you filtering out um, anything because they want that all presented there. But when you trace, you do have that ability to come in and filter, which can be really handy. Okay, we could say, all right, trace, show me everything that is, we'll choose myself, that is Adam. And here we go. All right. What else can we trace? So let's say you've got an event in your list and I need to pull up some events so that we can actually see. So we're going to do a multi-step here. We'll go back and do our historical there. All right. Let's say that you see a badge show up in your system that is not tied to a person, but there's a badge and maybe it got an access denied or an, an invalid ID, invalid badge, um, or whatever it may be, or even just a person, you want to see more about this person and where this person has been. So one thing we can do, we'll pick on Christian today. You can come and right click on that event. And again, you can do this from any, any trace window, any basically any alarm or, or event window. We're going to do it from our trace, but you can do it here in your main alarm monitor as well but you just need to select on that line item and right click and we're going to trace. Now, what are we going to trace? We can trace the controller. We already did that. We started with that first. We can trace the device or we can trace the badge. And really quick, another option is we can just say badge information. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna pull up the cardholder record for that person. And we can look at the badges and the access levels tied to those badges. All right, but let's trace it. Let's see what else we get. So trace, badge. Now, this is actually kind of a handy little pop-up. You, you know, you might think, well, it knows the badge number there, so why is it asking me for the badge number? One thing that this does is if you're trying to enroll cards in your system and maybe something's not working, um, you can't read the number off the card anymore, whatever reason. You can have, you can take that badge to a reader, scan it at that reader, and it'll pop up. And then you can, I mean, you could read and type, you know, like, like this is one, two, zero, zero. You could, you, you could just grab those numbers and type them. Or you can come up and hit trace and badge. And now it's already pre selected. So I can just right click or if you like keyboard shortcuts, control C. I can now copy this and now I can paste it into whatever new user record or, or whatever it is that I'm doing. So that's just a nice little workflow shortcut, I guess you could call it. All right, so we're gonna hit okay to trace this badge. All right, when, what context, when do we wanna do this? We'll do a live trace. We're also going to do our historical trace and let's go back again to the beginning of the month. And we'll say, okay, we also have the option to show only those alarms which have marked video. Again, I don't have video on my system, so that's not gonna do anything to me. 
Um, you can also just show, you can filter it and say, only show me items that are of this type. We're not gonna do that, but I will say okay, and we'll get our list. So here is everything for this month. And so we can see front, front door, secure vestibule door, just those are the main doors Christian uses. All right. So that's inside alarm monitoring. That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Now we can also do that inside of the web console. So we're going to come here to all alarms. Just get us a simple screen. We'll do uh, historical. We'll turn that on for seven days and we'll hit apply. All right. So... Let's pick on McKay this time. So I can, I've got a line item here for McKay coming in and I can click on his user and it's going to give me quick, quickly and easily without having to do anything else. So a single click gets me all the recent information, all the recent activity for this badge. Um, and in fact, it's actually giving us all of McKay's activity but we can click and specify an individual badge if we wanted to. Most of our guys have two badges, one that's a fob on their keychain and another that's a card in their wallet. That way, if you leave your keys on your desk, like I frequently do, you can still get in after you lock yourself out of the building. Haven't done that one before. Actually, just kidding. All right, so we got... Just really quick, easy reference to all the things that are happening there. Now, I've got an arrow over on the right-hand side, and when I click it, it's going to take me to the details for that particular event. Now, if these, these are access granted, we don't really care about the alarm detail, but if it was an access denied, you can come in and put a note and mark it in progress or acknowledge whatever you need to do per your alarm workflow. You can also save the trace, which created it, as you'll see, as a part of a new layout with that filter already in there. So we will actually save a copy of this and we're going to edit it. We're going to call McKay Trace. And there we go. So now we've got our nice custom layout and we can come back and trace McKay and we can do that in real time. In addition to the last 24 hours, I think is what that picked by default. All right, let's go back to all alarms and we'll go back to the same seven day historical. Okay, what other options do we have? So we've got the line item, we've got access granted. That's gonna take us the details on that particular alarm. Uh, if we come all the way out to the right hand side, we have the arrow, which is going to take us either to alarm details, we can respond in line, or it will take us to that door where we have the option to open the door or change the reader mode. We can also trace the device. So if I hit trace, so here's all the activity specific to the warehouse roll-up door. So that would be another way to trace. We can also, if we come to our hardware tree, we should be able to trace from here as well. So here's our warehouse roll-up door. Underneath that, you'll see the aux inputs and outputs if those are leveraged in your system at all. We can click our checkbox and then we've got a actions that has a trace so we can trace the device there now this is saying five devices the reason why it's saying five devices is because it selected the sub devices as well because i selected that top level box all right we can also click on it and that's going to give us just, again, that rolling history on that particular device.
All right. So tracing is really helpful, um, particularly when you are trying to get better clarity on what's happening with a door in your system or a badge in your system. Um, one scenario I've seen this used, and I, I don't have this mocked up to show you, but if you get a, uh, this is common per, uh, in like residential units, apartment units or things like that. You may see a lot of invalid badge entries. And oftentimes what that is, is it's somebody's got their wallet or their phone with their bank card and their key fob and, you know, whatever else attached to it. And uh, they, they take the whole unit, throw it on the reader, and the reader is confused about the data that it's getting back. And so you'll see a lot of invalid entries there. Um, you can trace those. Uh, and if this is tied to video, you can go back and see, okay, well, this person is doing this and this and this. And so now you've got an easy way to review um, maybe a user training skill set or tool, you know, opportunity in order to just to, to improve people's experience with the system. Okay. I think we've uh, covered that one sufficiently. And again, if there's any questions as we go through this, please, by all means, just drop them in. All right, we're going to look at maps next. So for maps, we need an application that is installed with our OnGuard system called Map Designer. And this is, this is one of the older applications that has not been updated yet. OnGuard has been making their way through. They started with um, system administration and then alarm monitoring. Um, and then they it, you know, made some additional improvements to the web interfaces as well. Um, now, whether they will make it through the whole list, I'd imagine they would. But for now, this one is as it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to click our once you get signed in, it's, you know, the normal sign in process. Uh, we'll hit new, the little new icon here, which is going to prompt us for a background image. So we are going to select a blank floor plan. Um, this will take bitmaps, JPEGs, most photo files, um, just for simplicity, I'm going to use a JPEG. And we're going to hit open. That's going to drop the floor plan in, that image in. And I'm going to scale it down, resize it down. That way it fits on my screen better as a, as a single unit. Okay. And then over on the left-hand side, what we have is our device tree. You'll notice that we've got GTC, we've got elements. So when LS2's elements platform is connected in here, so we can pull out doors there. Um, so let's do that. Let's take our PM office, which is this guy right here. Stick that on. Let's take our sales office. And let's take sales two. And we're just going to start dropping elements onto the map and support. All right, from there, we've got our main panel, our controller. Maybe that's an item we want to have on a map, so we'll drop that to physically represent where it is. I have a facility lockdown button attached to that panel just for demos. We'll drop that over there as well. Okay, and let's start dropping some doors on. So back door near the break room, that's this guy. Back door, double doors, that's this guy. Back door near the IDF, that's this guy. IDF door, that's here. IT racks, that's there. All right, optical turnstile in. And we can just keep going through the whole system and dropping our doors out. It's pretty quick, it doesn't take long. Unless you have a million doors, then it might take a few minutes. Warehouse man door. And last one, warehouse roll-up door. All right, so now that I've got those doors in there. Um, you can change the icon. Well, let me back up. 
Let's start with the label. When you add these in, you are not able to resize the icon or the text as a singular unit. You can change the text size. So it came up as font size seven. I can say make it 12. And you can see that that's going to scale that up. Now, when you have a lot of doors like me that are very close to each other, it may be beneficial to reposition those a little bit so that maybe the icon is near the door but not in the door. I've seen a lot of times where people just will pull this, like for example, for an office, they'll just pull it into the office area, seeing as it would be the only way into that space. So you can rearrange that a little bit to get you a little better layout. Um, or if you're like me, I do try to like to keep things near where the readers are. But that does require a little bit of rearrangement in some cases. So let's go back to a smaller font just so we've got a little more room. You can change also, you know, the font the bold, italic, whatever, the size, the color. All right. Let's see what else we can do here. We can add text. So I can just click my text icon up here, click and drag. And we're going to say, this is on guard doors with elements. Or you can call it floor one, main floor or we can call it interior anything along those lines we'll give this a big larger font size since it is there now these boxes you can grab the little squares on the corners and rearrange you can click and drag and put that wherever you want okay um, on your doors, on your readers, let's look at now the properties box. So these have predefined icons that are already associated with them. For example, we have a reader, so this one is a reader. But we can also change it to another or different icon if we want. You can also, instead of using a single icon for all hardware states, you can use icon groups. And so here's the reader with the different icon groups that we would get. And we can hit apply to that. And now we would have this changing statuses based on the door status. Let me come here. We'll do this on our front door as well. Properties, icon group. I want that reader, other options. We'd have to go to the icon library to see the other options there. We'll stick with the reader. Okay. Now, great, we've got a map. Let's hit save. Map name, GTC interior. Now let's say we have multiple floors. Um, I don't have multiple floors here, but I'm going to add a new map as well. And in this case, what I'm going to do is use a satellite image as my second map. And maybe on this one, we'll just drop a few doors here instead of everything. But we'll do, let's grab secure vestibule door. Nope, let's grab the front door. Front door. And we'll put that right here. And let's grab my back door. We'll grab the warehouse doors, man door, which is about right here. And the roll-up door, which is about right there. Okay. Now that we have multiple maps, and the reason I wanted to show you this is we can actually take our map and we can pull the map out. So let's hit save. We're going to call this GTC exterior. Let's go back to our interior map, double click it to open it. 
And I'm going to grab my exterior map and we'll pull that out as well. And we'll hit save. All right, so what that's done is we've now basically linked those two maps to each other. Let's minimize map designer here. And let's pull up maps inside of alarm monitoring. So view map. I might need to sign out and sign back in just so it pulls those, that updated list. All right. All right, so let's see. Maps, and here's our maps. So let's start with our exterior map. I hit OK. It pops up in a window. We can resize it if we want. And I have now the doors and the interior map. So let's click on the interior map, double click here, and it's going to now pop up that map. Notice it assumed the window of the previous one. And so it didn't open additional windows. And on here, we get all of our door statuses along with the icon. So we'll look at this back door. It is currently secure channel, access mode card only. Here we've got access mode pin or card. We can change that. So we can go, this is a right click on the icon. Set reader access mode, card only. And you have also your open doors, so you can send a door open command and so on. Okay, let's look at what that is inside of the web client. So we can go to maps. It automatically updates to show those maps. And we can hit start with our exterior. Now here we can actually mouse wheel in to zoom in and out. And when I click on a door, we'll do it on the other one. I can double click or single click just to get from one map to the next. Single click works just fine here. I can zoom in. I can see my doors. Now, I don't see all of that additional information here. But if I click on the door, now I get a little pop-up that's telling me about that. It's currently online. I can open the door. I can view pending alarms for this door, which is going to open up in a side panel. And I can see, so here's that door open command. We can acknowledge it. I also have a three button menu drop down where I can again open the door, change the reader mode. I can mask inputs, outputs, and all of the normal options. We can also jump to a jump to a trace straight from here for the device. I can also click just on the title of that door and it's gonna pull up recent activity. All right, so that's maps. Any questions on any of the topics that we've covered so far? Okay, if you do have any, please feel free to drop them in at any time. Can you copy maps? Uh, do you mean create duplicates of maps and uh, let's see, I believe you can. Let's jump back here to map designer. And if I have a map, mm -hmm. it doesn't want to seem to let me duplicate that map. You would have to pull it in as a new map. Let's see, it will let us pull in a new one. Ooh, did that replace it? I don't think so. Let's give it a few devices. And let me hit save and we'll do interior two. So I can set up additional maps. Do we have a, we do have a save as option as well. So let's test that out. So if I open my existing interior map with everything here, I can do map. Um, I can rename it. Let's try save as. We'll call this interior three and I can hit okay. And now we've got our duplicated map 
and we can come and modify and add additional elements in. So let's grab some of these spare ports here and I'll save. And if we come back over to our maps, now you can see here's my interior three, which has those additional devices on it versus just my normal interior which did not. So yes, you there is a save as option which would let you duplicate that that map with all of its existing devices and then you can modify as needed on that secondary. Okay. Let's shift now over to forms designer. So I went ahead and logged into this application and the very first thing you get after you log in is this very important warning. This application makes fundamental changes to your security system. If an unexpected system failure occurs, important data such as cardholder and badge information can be permanently lost. Ensure that all users currently logged on to the security system are not using the cardholder screen before continuing. It is important that you have an up-to-date backup of your database before continuing. Do you have an up-to-date backup of your database? And you can say no, in which case it won't let you proceed. Um, I made a backup prior to this session, so I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to select OK. The next thing is it's prompting us is what form do we want to modify? The alarm acknowledgement form, the asset form, cardholder form, reader form, visitor form, or sorry, visit or visitor form. We're going to look at the cardholder because it's probably the one that most people are familiar with. And I'm going to select OK. And now that we've done that, I can take that application full screen. Now, this should look very familiar. It is the cardholder and badge forms. And we have these existing icons and text and labels and everything. And this can be a lot um, if you're not familiar with these sorts of things. Basically, what we have here on the left-hand side is a list of already existing on-guard objects. These are items that exist in the database already. Some of these may already be on the form, and some of them may not be. Below that, we have some additional database fields. We also have the ability to add additional fields. I'm not sure why this arranged itself to where my icons are above my title bar. That's strange. Okay. All right. So we can open an existing form, which we did. So we'll just go back to cardholder, back to where we were. You can save that form. You have a selector tool, a label tool, an insert text field insert numeric field, insert date field, insert drop-down list, help context, execute configuration, new configuration, open configuration, save configuration, and then we've got things like access levels, actions, and uh, conditions and filters and a bunch of other things. So if we wanted to very simplistically say, all right, this division field here, we don't really use division, like that's not the right word for our company. You can come and change it. If you right click, it's going to pop up the properties for that, or you can double click and get to the same point. So object name, this is what it's called in the database. And here's the text, and here's the assigned field. 
This is the, the field, the assigned field is this box. If we double click that, so here's the object name as it exists in the database, the field name, and so on. Okay, so if we wanted to change the label, the text for that, we don't want to call it division. We want to call it um, maybe remote or on-site. Are you a remote worker or an on-site worker? And we can leave the rest of it the same. And what we can do now, you can modify the font, the size, everything else. The general settings are, again, the object name, left. How far left is this, you know, that, or, or where is the left side of this located? It's located at 295 pixels from the left-hand side of this form. The top is 222 pixels from the top of the form. Um, if, if you've done any kind of like visual basic programming or UI design, uh, these coordinate systems are very common inside of that, that type of application. How wide is my label? How tall is my label? And it's viewable on cardholder page and so on. Okay, let's hit okay. And there we go. It changed remote slash onsite. Now inside of your system administration, um, I believe we looked at it last time, but we can do that as well. I just need to pull up system administration and get logged into that. Um, we can already... Sorry, I can't type and talk my sorry, I can't talk and type my password at the same time. Okay, so inside of access control administration, we want to go to list builder. So it still says division here because we haven't we haven't saved those changes yet. Um, but we could say remote only type employee. We can say a hybrid. And we can add a on-prem employee. Okay. So here, department, on-site, remote. We've got that drop-down. We've updated what that list is. And now we can save. Before I save it, though, we turn off this actually I'll explain what's happening so we have a door forced open that caused a focus to this window which made it pop up sometimes you want that sometimes it's annoying if you don't want it to do that this automatic visual notification uncheck that box and that application won't keep launching on top of what you're trying to do all right so let's jump back over to system administration and I don't have that form open. So let's hit save. Save cosmetic user interface changes only. Data is not effective. Save and destroy any existing user-defined cardholder data. Save and preserve any existing user-defined cardholder data. This is where you can really mess up your database if you're not being careful. Only changes I made here were cosmetic. All we did was change the, the label associated with this data field. So we're going to say save cosmetic only does not affect the data. Are you sure you want to save your changes? After saving, you will have to restart any application servers and IIS websites to complete the update. We're going to hit yes. Now, oftentimes I find that OnGuard says you need to restart this and this and this in order for this to happen. Um, and you don't always have to. So we're gonna just gonna we're gonna gamble here. Go to administration and card holders. We're gonna see if that updated. And I did have not adjusted scaling for this application yet, but um, you can see it says now remote and on site. And if we add in my drop down box, we have hybrid, on prem, and uh, remote only. All right. 
before we dig any deeper, let's just take about a, let's take a five minute break. I'll adjust the scaling on my system administration so we can see that better as we continue to move forward. And uh, at the end of that five minute break, we'll pick up where we left off. All right, and we are back. So while we're on the topic of adjusting the scaling of some of the on-guard windows, um, what happens is the applications are, are generally all built for a 1920 by 1080 display. And when you are running that resolution on, on most sized monitors, um, the 100% scaling is generally where you're at. Anytime your scaling goes up or down or is basically different from 100%, um, applications can start to be get a, a little weird in how they look. And this is not just unique to Linnell. This, this is actually a lot of applications. Um, but what you do, just so you guys know how to find it or how to fix it. Let me resize my window here a little bit. Um, you can do it on the executable or you can do it on the shortcut. So here I just have the shortcuts as they are found inside of my start menu. And I'm going to right click and hit properties. And then we go to compatibility. And you can do this just for yourself or you can change it for all users. And what you're going to do is change high DPI settings. And generally I find that you want to check this box for the first item. And we're gonna say, I like to use the um, use DPI settings that's set for my main display when I open the program. And then the high DPI scale override and system or system enhanced are generally the two that you wanna look at. Um, honestly, I don't know the difference between them, but they both seem to work. So we'll just say enhanced because why not? It's enhanced. Hit OK and OK. And now when I launch system administration, it's going to open weird for the first time. And I'm going to log in. And then I can make that full screen. And now my icons are fine, are, are much better. My, my, my menus are better. And so we'll go back to our cold card holders form. And now we can see better that remote on site. And if I hit modify or add, now we've got those list items there. So this is a really easy way to tweak the, the existing forms to modify the information. All right. So what else can we do with this? Let's close this window. Yes, I want to abandon changes, minimize that. And now we're back here to our form. Let's say we want to actually now add a new piece of information. So let's grab, we have to kind of know what we want to add. If we want to add a date field, maybe we want to track something like higher date. All right, so let's grab a date field and we click it and then we click and drag out on the window and it's going to pull up this set of properties. So it's giving it a name, FLD field date 865 field name and here's the type. So it is a date, or you can change it to numeric or text. What this is doing is it's changing the format that OnGuard or the database is expecting that, that information to be in. Okay, so we'll say date. Do we want it required? All right, so date format, short date, no time. That works for me. A default date, if you wanted to, you could put in a default date. now. Here's a tricky part. Whatever you put for default 
has to match the format that you've selected or the template that you've applied. So if we pop out the key here down on the bottom, now we get a valid template characters. Nines are only uh, numbers. A's are only alphabetic letters, N's. And so, you know, this is pretty similar if you're, you know, if you're ever doing data validation inside of Excel, uh, very similar in its approach. Um, but for typically, you would do like a template on a on a number. And let's say we wanted this to be a phone number. We'll actually do that in a minute. So let's just stick with dates. I'm not going to do a default. I'm not going to do a template. Um, all of this other information gets you a lot of drop downs and selectability. We're going to leave all of that empty. Um, v card, this would tie to that employee's V card inside of OnGuard. We'll leave that all alone. Okay. And we'll hit OK. Now we have this and it pops up. Now, one thing we might want to do is because we had to click and drag it, we might want to say, okay, what is the physical size of my other boxes? This one's height is a, sorry, this one's height is 22. So I'm going to make the height of this one also 22. And we're going to hit OK. All right. Now we need a label there because we just have the box. So we need a label. You can also use the arrow keys. So if we want to line it up with one of the existing boxes on the left-hand side, then we can arrow down and get it in an approximate spot. And now let's get a label. So we're going to drag, click on our label, and click and drag. We're going to, we can leave the object name as is, or we can, you know, we can assign our own object names. Now we're going to say uh, this needs to be higher date. And we're going to say that this is connected to the one that we just did, which was, I believe it was FLD date 865. And we'll say, okay. And if we want to add punctuation, we can do that. And now we can make them a little closer to each other. And now it looks like we've just made a pretty standard thing. All right, let's hit save. Now this one, because we've added a field, the database has to be updated. So we can destroy any existing user-defined data. I'd rather not do that. So let's save and preserve. It's gonna take a minute because it has to go through and update and create these data fields and entries for all of my existing hard card holder datas. So I'm comfortable doing this though, because I made a backup and I can hit okay. And it says there are currently 53 objects that will be affected. The amount of time to complete this operation depends on the speed of your computer and may take as long as 53 seconds. I'm guessing that's based on a one second per object. After saving, you'll have to restart when deleting UDF fields and software events. Um, are in use for open access data conduit. You must clear the checkbox and so on. So let's hit yes. All right, now it's processing all of our records and it is done. It's going to reload our form here. Excellent. Now let's come over to system administration. I'm going to go to card holders. And now we have a higher date. If I hit add, Let's see what it makes us do. So if we go 03, 12, uh, 2010, yeah. last name's required. Actually, let me do this. Let's hit cancel and let's search for myself and add. And we'll actually go 11, let's see, 19, 2019. Oh wait, that didn't. Yeah, modify. I hit add. My bad. 11, 19, 2019. Now, I suspect I'm going to get an error because of the format here, but let's see. Hit OK. Hey, it didn't error out. And now I have data there. 
All right, so you can kind of start to see how you can build this to be more inclusive of the data that you want to track. And this actually is going to lead us into um, our next section here, which is advanced reports. And bef well, before we jump over to advanced reports, let's look at what else we can do with, with the forms designer. Adam, do you want to address the question in the chat? Yes. So the question in the chat is, can you modify appearance as well as information, like swap the background image? Um, by background image, are you talking about like a background image on the form? I'm a little unclear what you're asking there. <laughs> yes, background image on the form. Good question. Let's see. Insert. So we have the ability to insert label, text field, encrypted text field, data field, system object, view only control, object. I wonder if we can do a label and then attach an image instead. I've never tried to add an image so this is a good question. Yeah, for example, if you wanted to put a company logo on the form. Um, to do. I'm not seeing an image as an option. Insert system object. View only control. These are all existing data fields. I don't believe you can do anything with the background. Nothing is giving me that option or ability. Um, which means you wouldn't be able to modify the coloring or anything like that. You can change as far as just appearance. Um, we can change the font, so we could do, maybe we're, we like the Calibri font, so we can do that instead. We can make it bold. We can come and make that um, as a required field. So that seems to be what our capabilities are there. Okay. Oh, I we have not looked in one place yet. Let's also go check the web interfaces. So if I go back to, now we want to go to credentials because we want to look at people's credentials, which is the cardholder variant. And we'll pick Bruce Banner. He's a good friend. And cardholder. Now you'll notice here, I don't have those custom fields showing here. So it should be on the cardholder form. And we've got all of the standard ones. But I don't have, oh, no, we do have the field date. Okay, so it is kind of there. Um, it's not showing the right name. We would have to, like it said, restart um, the app services or IAS. Um, we can go back and look at that menu, um, but we can specify now our date. And here we get a nice drop down. So we'll just say his hire date was May 1st. And also if we go back to cardholder, um, we had the division. So again, that hasn't updated because we haven't restarted the web services, but we have our pre-filled items, so remote only. Done, and save. So just know that when you modify and edit these forms, it applies to both the thick clients, everywhere you see that, and the thin clients, the web clients. Okay, back to Forms Designer. Now, one thing I wanted to see is on this, 
do we have the ability to do a date, uh, like calendar type entry like we, we have in other places? Um, for example, here on badge, we have it here. Let's look at what our options are on this guy. So it is a date, um, 16 length, short date, time, no seconds, field styles, multi-line, horizontal scrolling, a border. I don't see a template there. I wonder though if it was a drop down instead. Um, so we have insert drop down list. Let's see what we get out of that. Because the box itself looks kind of drop down ish, right? And default. Field name. No, I don't think it's a drop down. That I'd have to play with a little bit more um, because I know we've got the capabilities because we have that here. Right clicking doesn't give you a copy yet option or anything like that. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. So that we'd have to look at specifically what it is. It looks like it's just a text entry, which means we should be able to replicate that here for our hire date because we've got that same text entry. It's just going to be something tied to um, our format. So short date, time, no seconds. I feel like that should do it, just that selection there, but it doesn't seem to want to. All right, well, moving on. Um, that'll be to play with another day. So if we were to do, let's do a, we've got a phone number and an office number. Let's look really quick at what is... So we've got our home telephone number. We could change that to a mobile number or a cell number if we wanted to create that. Um, there's no template here for the entry, but we could we could force that if we wanted to. Um, so again, looking at our legend on what these are, we could force a template for something like, and it gives us even kindly some examples. So standard US Canada phone number, we're going to put in the characters that we want. So we want our parentheses. We want to only in allow numbers, and we want three of them. End parentheses, space, and then 999-9999. So that would get us a standard U.S. Uh, phone number. Now, we could do the plus one on there if we wanted to. Actually, we wouldn't do a plus one. We'd do a plus nine which would get us uh, country codes. Sometimes you need more than one digit, though, for a country code, so you might need to do that. Social security number, uh, U.S. zip with a four-digit code, and so on for that. So that would force us to enter a phone number in that format. So we'll do that, and we will hit save. And... We will hit preserve and OK and yes. OK, so while that's saving, let's come over here to our system administration. I already had that form open. Let's close it, relaunch it. And now you can see our phone number here. So we'll hit search Winterton. There I am modify, and we'll say 801-703-3075, and OK. Now we have that in that format. And I didn't type in the parentheses or the spaces or the dash, anything like that. 
because we had that in template format, it pre-filled it. Now, if I modify it, and if I if I invalidate that template, so let's say it's like I typo something wrong, it won't let me add in additional digits. So as I'm typing in five, 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 it's not adding them in. So it's it's a great way to force data integrity on your on your data entry points. Okay. Let's look now at our advanced reporting. I think that's a good way to go. So here in our web client, we're gonna go back to our dashboard, our console dashboard, come down to the bottom, and we have reports. And let's say, let's look at access granted events. It's gonna pop up a new window Choose your time zone, start date, end date. Let's do uh, May 21st to June 20th. Yep, that should get us about, you know, months worth of information. So we'll leave that. Apply start and end date, time to each day. No, don't worry, don't want to do that. Um, save as defaults and so on. So you, let's hit submit. And this is going to run a generic report. But what's really cool about these reports is right now they basically come up in a simple view. All right. And it's multiple pages. I can scroll. It'll, it'll go through the pages. Here's page two. Here's page three. Let's change it now to interactive view. And up in the top right corner, there's a little shortcut that does that. When I click on that, now we've got some new information off on the right-hand side. So we've got parametric controls. Uh, form controls, filter controls, so we can modify what our filters are and things like that. But mainly what people want to do when they get into here is like, okay, we added this um, field and we want to put that field on the form in some way. So for example, here we've got access granted events. Let's say we wanted to know the uh, is this a remote employee coming in? Is it a, I mean, why is our remote employee coming in all day long, right? That might be helpful to know. Um, might also be good to know, um, you know, their, their mobile number since we put that in there or their phone number. So let's see what our options are. So we want to grab first, let's grab... Now, we did not name it, and actually, it might not show up here without me restarting stuff. Okay, so here it is, field date 865. Now, I didn't name that field date, that 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 data column, so that's what it's showing up as, but I, here's what I can do. I can click and drag. I'm going to stick it out here on my header bar, and let's say, let's put it right here at the end after our employee name, after the cardholder name. Form reloads, and here is our field date. Now, this field date, this was our hire date. So we can actually come and we can change this. It's by default going to show the name of that field, but we can modify it. No, maybe it won't let us modify it. I thought we could. It wants to revert. If we would have named it, it would have done it the right way. Full data, partial data. Style, we could say this is the style of the form. All right. We can also grab our, let's see, it was called home phone number, but we left it as that. So phone, I don't, it might just be that generic phone one. We'll find out here. Yep, there it is. There's that data. Um, you can right click on elements as well. We can remove the column. We can insert group column, detail column, summary column. We can add a bunch of things. So we could do, uh, we can aggregate on a particular type of data. Counts, maximum, minimums. Convert to a group. We can group it by, so group above, group left above, and hit OK. So we can group it by that. Um, in this particular layout, that's probably not too, too helpful. 
others it would be. Table cell, table row, table, table cell. Let's look at that option. So table cell, background, transparent, name, order, options. We go to properties, label properties. So here's the name. I wonder if it'll let us change it here. Higher date, text, higher date, name, text, position. We can change the size or the padding around it, the font, the border. We can make this all bold if we wanted to, which it is, and display and hit OK. Go back to our basic view. And there we have our updated form. We can export that, print it, save it, export. Give it a name. Lots of options. So this, this completely replaced the old crystal reports uh, that were there. Um, save to file. View export results, selectable table, format. We want PDF, Excel, HTML, text, RTF. Lots of options on our export formats there. We'll just say PDF. And let's just see what the default options get us. Processing report. It opens there in a PDF with all of our results. So there is a lot of possibility and capability that exists through these custom reports, through the, the, the ability to add or edit reports. Let's close that one out. Now, I made those changes. If I go back and run that report again, those changes weren't saved, and so they shouldn't be here. I'll submit. Let's see what we get. Now we're back to normal, back to defaults. So if I modify this, let's grab again, we'll do UDF and we'll say, we'll grab this field date. We'll pull that out here to the right. Let's also see what we can do to filter. What are our options to filter? Let's get rid of these open door command. So we want to filter on event. And we want, um, we basically want is not. So is not equal to access granted. We'll say that one. Or event is not. Come on, event. And we'll grab that one end and hit OK. We'll hit apply. And now we can close that. We still kept them um, open to see door used. So let's check our filter again. Door used and door not used. Make sure I grab those correctly. Whoops, where did my label go? Undo. Nice thing is there's an undo button. Okay. So we can save this report as a new report. So if there's a report that you are running regularly, take an existing report, mock it up the way that you want, and save it as a new report. So we'll save in public reports. You can even save it as a private report just for you. Okay, that's where I'll put mine. And we're going to call this access granted events. Um, and we'll actually, actually, we'll say this. Yeah, we'll say access granted events with employee with remote work status. Except I need to grab that field instead of this one. 
save successfully. So let's modify it. Let's get rid of this field, delete, remove column, and let's grab our UDF. And that was under division, pull out division. And there we go. All right. Now we want to save that as again. Actually, I could just hit save. And yes, save successfully. So now if I close that, if I go to my reports, we should have, let's see if we can find it. Might need to refresh my screen, maybe not. It was access granted events, so it was started with this. Let's refresh. On guard reports. What I'm missing is, those are the public reports. Where are the private reports? That added the field, 56, 56 shown. Well, I will have to figure out why my, the my report section does not show up. I wonder if that's an issue on my system. But let's really quick, what we'll do is we'll do access granted events again. We'll go back to that same thing, submit, and we will go to interactive, UDF. We'll grab our division, pull that out, add it there, save as, and this time we're going to save it just out of curiosity. So there it is, it did save. You click that and now I can go public reports and hit okay. Saved successfully. All right, let's close that. Refresh my report screen. Access granted events with remote work status. So there's our report. We can run it. And it has already our division, which was our remote work status column there. All right. Um, you can also then schedule these reports, which would allow you to have them, for example, run weekly on, let's say, uh, pick Friday at 8 a.m. And you could have that in your inbox and ready for you every Friday at 8 a.m. Run this task periodically, run this task at... Specify the period for that the time zone. Where do we want to publish it to? We want to publish to the disk, Excel, TFT, any parameters associated with that. Notification. So this is what most people would probably use here. Add recipients to and with the message and so on. So I believe what that does, it'll just tell you that the report is ready. It may have a link to the report or there may be ability to add a link to a report. All right. And give it a name. and finish. At least one published method is required. Okay, so let's say publish to PDF. And finish. There we go. All right. And that's how that goes. Any questions on there? I, I, I know the uh, reports are a common ask. One thing I will point out, um, while anyone's, if they've got questions while they're typing it, 
there there's a set of reporting that comes default included with OnGuard. And then there is an add-on license which gets you a, a set of advanced reports. And so if there's a report that you want that you're not able to complete or to create yourself, um, it may exist already in that advanced report. Um, and you can kind of see here in the description, for example, this visitor record activity report, list of visitors, um, as we come to the end of that, supports adding UDFs with a, with optional advanced reporting license. So so some, some features, some functions um, do require that advanced reporting license uh, in order to add additional, you know, or certain information to it or whatever. Um, if we go up to the one we were looking at, we were looking at the access granted events, um, supports adding card holder and badge UDFs with, a, with the optional advanced reporting license. So in addition to the ability to edit those, you also get... Um, something like 60, I think, other reports in addition to. So if that is something that you're interested in looking at, we can definitely have some conversations uh, with your with your sales rep on that as well. So, okay. Well, that that's the information that I had prepared to show you today. Um, I'm happy to take the time. And if there's any questions related to what we've talked to or unrelated to what we've talked to, we can definitely uh, pursue that. Yes, and absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we will be uh, posting this recording to YouTube and it will be available and accessible there. And hey, while you're on our YouTube channel, come check out any of the previous content that you may have missed. There is some valuable information here. There's a couple gold nuggets, you know, golden nuggets as well. Um, if you missed our trailer, come check out our trailer open house. Uh, if you want to know more about Milestone and some advanced topics in Milestone, come check that out. Uh, if you want to review the previous OnGuard sessions, here's our March OnGuard session where we covered topics there. So again, thanks for joining. We hope to see you next time around and we will talk to you later. Don't hesitate to reach out again to any of your sales or support resources if you've got any further questions. Thanks and see you next time.